Hello, welcome to another episode of the Conscientious Biologist, Ben Gallagher. This one's the 10th and last one in the body communication series, and we look at the control of fertility. Now, it's very important that you've just watched Body Communication 9 on the menstrual cycle, because part of this video looks at the hormonal interactions and how we can control them to either increase or decrease someone's fertility. Fertility, of course, being how easily or how much difficulty someone has in getting pregnant. This is from the GCSE specification, and as always, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you. So before we start talking about control and fertility, let's just remind ourselves with how a woman gets pregnant and let's look at um, conception in humans. So you need a father and a mother. Each of those produce gametes, which if you remember were produced by meiosis. Meiosis being the type of cell division that produces cells that have 50% of the parental DNA. That's called haploid, and in males those are sperm cells, and in females it's an ovum or ova. Now the sperm and the egg have to join together, that's fertilization, that's normally by intercourse. Um, at fertilization the sperm and the egg cells will fuse together, or the nuclei will fuse together, and that will make you your first diploid cell, which is a zygote. It's the zygote cell that will then multiply and become all the other cells. So that zygote, uh, this would now be in the fallopian tubes or oviducts of the woman, that's going to start to multiply to become an early embryo. Remember from the last video that early multiplication is based on the nutrients that are already inside the ovum. After this point, they need to rely on an external nutrient source. So they need to implant themselves into the wall of the uterus, into the endometrium, which was made of capillaries, which will give them the nutrients they need from the mother's blood to multiply and differentiate and change into a recognizable organism, a baby. So that's what we're talking about. How can we manipulate and change everything that's in this diagram to try and increase the chances of pregnancy? or decrease them, because a lot of the times the manipulation that humans want to do with fertility is to reduce their chances of pregnancy so they don't get pregnant when they don't want to be. So let's get rid of all the descriptions, but keep the main diagram here. And let's look at this a stage at a time to see how you can disrupt the normal reproductive mechanisms here to try and make changes. So we're going to change the title to decreasing fertility now because we're trying to prevent a pregnancy and prevent this line from going on. So if we look a stage at a time, the first thing we could do up there is to try and prevent the man from producing sperm. If the man, man can't produce or release sperm, there's not going to be sperm to fertilize the egg, so you're not going to get a baby. Now, the only real way you can do this is a pretty permanent solution. It's something called a vasectomy. Now, a vasectomy is an operation where the tubes from the testes are severed. Those tubes are called the vas deferens, and if they're snipped, if they're cut and tied off, then the sperm can't travel out of the testes down the penis to go into the woman at intercourse, so she's not going to get pregnant because there's no sperm. Now, this is a permanent permanent thing. So this would only be done if a man's maybe already had children or absolutely decides no way that I want children could have this operation to prevent him from producing sperm so that he's not going to have babies. But that's not to be taken lightly. If we look at the second option here of trying to prevent the mother from releasing eggs, that's something that can be done in a more straightforward way and it's not permanent. What happens there is a woman can take the contraceptive pill. Now this is probably the most common form of contraception that there is, but this is starting to manipulate the hormonal cascades seen in the menstrual cycle to disrupt those. So let's just go back and refresh ourselves on what's happening in the menstrual cycle. So this is going to be a very quick run through. If you haven't yet studied the menstrual cycle, go back and watch the previous video on that because we're just going to whiz through it so that we can explain how the contraceptive pill can disrupt it. So remember, the menstrual cycle is a 28 day cycle on average. So that's four weeks. So we can put the numbers in zero, seven days, 14 days, 21 days and 28 days is the same as day zero because it's a cycle. Now, menstruation itself, which is the breakdown of the endometrium, where the, that capillary lining of the uterus breaks down, passes out through the cervix, out through the vagina. That's generally going on from day zero to five. So the first hormonal involvement is the FSH secreted by the pituitary, goes into the blood and travels to the ovary, tells the ovary to start to mature an egg. And remember an egg, uh, that immature egg is called a follicle, which is why FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone, because that's exactly what it does. That maturing egg within the ovary triggers the ovary to release estrogen. 
oestrogen tells the uterus to start to build up the endometrium. So these two vital things, the egg maturing and the endometrium building, are happening during the first half of the menstrual cycle here up to day 14. Now, really importantly, remember that oestrogen has a secondary function in that it inhibits FSH production. So FSH doesn't get secreted by the pituitary once oestrogen has been released by the ovaries. Just to complete the cycle, remember LH is secreted from the pituitary at day 14. LH causes ovulation, which is the egg release from the ovary. Because the egg's been released, the ovary stops secreting oestrogen because there's no maturing egg in it anymore to tell it to do so, which means something else has to take over. So the ovary starts producing progesterone and progesterone maintains the endometrium through the second half of the menstrual cycle right up until about day 27 when progesterone stops. And of course, without progesterone maintaining the endometrium, the endometrium breaks down so we get menstruation again and we complete the cycle. But the really important part of this whole cycle for decreasing a woman's chance of fertility, decreasing her chance of getting pregnant, is the bit that's above me here, the arrow with the inhibits on there. Oestrogen inhibits FSH. So in the contraceptive pill, there's quite a high concentration of oestrogen. It also contains progesterone to kind of uh, help stabilize and balance it out and make it work more complete. But it's the oestrogen in the contraceptive pill telling the pituitary gland not to release FSH. That means if a woman's taking the contraceptive pill, she shouldn't be producing FSH, which means she's not going to mature an egg, which means there won't be a mature egg to be fertilized. If there's no mature egg to be fertilized, she's not going to get pregnant. Now, it's very, very important that you understand it, whether you're a girl watching this or a boy watching this, because you both would need to have responsibility if you're planning fertility in the future, that the contraceptive pill must be taken very strictly in line with the guidance that comes with it. It has to be taken every day at certain times. Um, it needs to be taken for the full amount of days that you're supposed to be taking it. It can be affected by illness or stress, so it's not 100% reliable. So if in the future you are looking at the contraceptive pill as a mechanism to control fertility, you must make sure you're following the directions on it properly or it won't work. OK, hormones are very sensitive to changes in your body and in your environment, stress being a major one. So just make sure you do that properly. But for your exams, make sure you understand that the contraceptive pill is mainly oestrogen with progesterone to stabilize it. But the oestrogen is preventing FSH, so preventing a mature egg. So let's go back to this slide now. Uh, and we've got those two that we've already talked about. So let's move on to the third thing. So if we were looking at here, instead of trying to prevent the man producing sperm or the woman producing eggs, if we're trying to prevent them actually fertilizing, then you've got a far more simple method. And this is a very common one of just using physical barriers to prevent the sperm from getting to the egg. So this would be condoms are the most commonly used thing or a diaphragm, which just fits over the cervix up inside the vagina to stop the sperm getting through the cervix and to the eggs. But condoms catch the sperm uh, as they're released either mechanism, it's a physical barrier that stop the sperm from getting to the egg. So this is a really common form of contraception to decrease the chance of getting pregnant. Um, if we're looking at the next stage now, and we're looking at trying to prevent this from going on, so prevent the implantation stage, then there's other devices that women can have fitted, something called an intrauterine device or the coil. This is a little device that's fitted up inside the uterus. So it has to be put up through the cervix, opened up inside the uterus. And what that does is it releases copper into the uterus and copper prevents an egg from being able to implant into the uterus. It's a very effective form of contraception. It can be taken out at any time. It can be put in at any time, um, but it would need a doctor to do that. But that's to prevent implantation of an egg. So fertilization could still happen. That egg may start to multiply into an early embryo, but if it can't implant, it's not going to set off the triggers that say halt the menstrual cycle. And when the endometrium breaks down, that fertilized egg is going to pass out with everything else. OK, um, 
The last thing really that we can talk about here is the timing of intercourse, because that's a massive thing that lots of people use to affect their chances of fertility, because fertility massively varies through the menstrual cycle. There are times during the menstrual cycle where if a couple have sex, they're very likely to get pregnant. And there are times when there's virtually no chance of getting pregnant. So we're going to look at that next. But this really is a complete list of all the ways that you can decrease fertility. So you might wanna take a screenshot of this one just before we go on to explain the timing, because that's not just about decreasing, you can use that for increasing fertility as well. So if we're controlling fertility by timing, and note I've changed the title not to decreasing, now it's just controlling, because this can be used to decreasing or increasing. If I pull up the menstrual cycle again, so we've got this 28 day cycle. The highest fertility is at around about day 14. More specifically, highest fertility is at ovulation. I say why it's usually around day 14 is because on average, most women do ovulate on day 14. But the reason why that's got the highest chance of fertility, for a start, it's a brand new egg. That egg's only just been matured, so it's full of nutrients. It hasn't had to use any yet for its own survival, so it's in a really good uh, good state. It's also in the optimum position for fertilization. Remember we said in the last video you want fertilization to happen very far up the oviduct or fallopian tube so that that fertilized egg can float down, do its first divisions, become an embryo, a small embryo, and then implant. If it happens much later, it's not going to have time to make those early divisions. It's not going to be uh, divided into a state where it can successfully implant. So you need it to have time. It's in that perfect position on day 14 because it's literally just been released into the oviduct. Third thing, it's a brand new endometrium. Day 14 is when the endometrium is at its absolute best before it's had any chance to break down or what progesterone has taken over to try and maintain it. So if the egg is fertilized then and can start to multiply into an embryo, it's gonna have a really good endometrium to link onto to start to feed off the mother's capillaries and the mother's blood, okay? So day 14, if a couple have sex on day 14, there's a roughly 30% chance of pregnancy. Now 30% that may not seem very much, and if you've got 30% in a test, I hope you'll be very disappointed with yourself. But actually when it comes to making a baby, something so significant, 30% is massive. That's basically a one in three chance. Those are really good odds of having a baby. Those percentages as well, I should say, apply for a young, healthy couple with no other problems, their lives aren't too stressful, they're not ill. Uh, if all the conditions are sort of optimal, then there's a 30% chance of pregnancy. Now, moving away from that highest chance of fertility, you've got decreasing fertility as you move back through the menstrual cycle, as you move backwards from day 14. Now, the reason for that is prior to day 14, there's no egg yet. Remember, the egg was only released in ovulation on day 14. So on day 12, there isn't an egg in the oviduct to be fertilized. And yet it's decreased fertility, it's not no chance of fertility. And that's because sperm can survive for several days until the egg is released. So if a couple had sex on like day 10, 11, the sperm could go through the cervix into the uterus, they could swim down the oviducts and basically just sit outside the ovary for four or five days until ovulation. And as soon as that egg is released, the sperm are there and could fertilize it straight away. Now, of course, sperm don't live forever. So the longer the sperm wait, the fewer survive. So chances get less and less as you move back from day 14. If you look at about day 10, then the chance of fertility there drops to about 15%. Now that's still quite high, okay? So if you're thinking, oh great, okay. So if we have sex on day um, nine or 10, we no chance of getting pregnant. 15% is still quite a high chance of getting pregnant. As you move back further from day 10, you go back to sort of day, day eight, day six or whatever, the chance drops down very, very low. But the decreased fertility in the first half of the menstrual cycle is because the egg isn't there, so the sperm has to wait around. Now, <clears throat> after ovulation, it's rapidly decreasing fertility. So as soon as that egg has been released, really within a day, your chance of getting pregnant drops very, very low. And if a couple was having sex on day kind of 16, 17, 18, anything like that, your chances drop down close to zero, not 
zero though and that's really really important to know if a couple were deciding okay we're not going to use condoms we're not going to use a contraceptive pill we're just going to have sex in the second half of each menstrual cycle yes you've got a dramatically reduced chance of getting pregnant but you still could okay it might only be like a one in 200 chance of getting pregnant but one in 200 still means it happens for every 200 people or every 200 times sex was had in that second half okay so it's a much lower chance but it is still a chance the reason being the eggs getting older so it's used up some of its nutrient supply the endometrium is getting less receptive it's getting more damaged it's getting more worn down over time and the position of the egg is less optimal that position of the egg high up in the oviduct is really important for for fertility so take a screenshot of this you should have learned a lot about this personally irrespective of your exams this is really important stuff but you're likely to be asked in the exams when is optimal fertility during the menstrual cycle and why so that's all this stuff at the bottom here but you could well be asked this stuff up here as to why could a couple still get pregnant if they had sex on day 11 even though there's no egg and that's about the sperm survival chances so take a screenshot of this one then we'll move on to other mechanisms for increasing fertility so the first one of these is doing something to cause something that's really obviously going to increase fertility and this is using hormone injections but specifically fsh injections because think what fsh does it stimulates the follicles or the immature eggs to mature into mature eggs which can be fertilized well if a woman's being given or giving herself fsh injections she's going to produce more eggs each month if she produces two eggs uh, that month instead of one she doubles her chance of conception because if there's more eggs then more chance more chance that sperm will find one now this can be quite a dangerous form of treatment for increasing fertility because of course if a woman takes too much fsh or her body's too sensitive to it maybe she'll release six eggs if all six eggs get fertilized then that woman is going to get pregnant with six babies that's a massive stress on her body to have that many kids so this isn't a very commonly given treatment it's actually generally given to sort of lead into this next thing which is ivf or in vitro fertilization you've probably heard of ivf we mentioned it in a previous video when we were doing about somatic cell cloning um, and we also did it when we were looking at therapeutic cloning um, but ivf is basically where you do fertilization outside the body in vivo is inside the body in vitro is outside the body so you still need the mother and father so this would be if this couple is really struggling to have children and that the main reason why they're struggling to have children is that the sperm can't get to the egg or can't find the egg maybe the man's got a very low sperm count so there aren't many sperm being released and given that most sperm fail to find the egg the chances of one finding the egg if there's very few sperm in the first place is very, very low. So what you can do is get the couple to donate sperm and eggs. Now, men produce millions and millions and millions of sperm, so that's easy. But the woman would only produce one egg a month unless she has the FSH injection, so produces lots. Then what you could do is harvest lots of her eggs from her if she makes, you know, let's if she has fsh injections she might produce four eggs which can be they're kind of like a miniature vacuum that goes up through the cervix that gently sucks them out so that you've got multiples of her eggs it's easy to get multiples of the sperm and what you can then do outside of the body so in vitro is fertilization you literally take the eggs and you put the sperm on the egg so that there's zero chance of that sperm not finding the egg it is on the egg hasn't got to swim any distance hasn't got to get lost hasn't got two tubes to choose from hasn't got to fit through the cervix you're literally doing all the work for it and you're putting it there that should guarantee fertilization as long as the sperm and the eggs are still alive and viable now if they fertilize then they should then do mitosis to form embryos so you can see the embryos now in that dish we're still talking in vitro outside of the body if you've got those embryos all you then need to do is choose the most viable one and implant it back into the mother so it's now put back through the cervix put onto the endometrium in her uterus where hopefully 
it will implant. And if it does, pregnancy should follow and that woman should be pregnant. Now, there's no genetic manipulation or modification going on here. The baby that that woman will become pregnant with is their baby, 50% from the father, 50% from the mother. So it's totally natural. You've just given nature a little bit of a helping hand by putting the sperm on the egg rather than relying on intercourse and the sperm being able to swim to the egg. So this is an absolutely amazing process that's actually been done for several decades now. OK, so take a screenshot of this one because IVF does come up quite a lot in the exams. And that covers all of it. So all I'm going to do now is give you one final slide with an overview for the control of fertility that should lead to or prevent pregnancy. So you've got decreasing fertility and increasing fertility. For decreasing, you've got preventing the father releasing sperm, which is by vasectomy, which is an operation which is permanent, which would need a lot of consideration before going for. You've got prevent the mother from releasing mature eggs, which is the contraceptive pill, very commonly used, but you must know the hormonal mechanisms behind that. You've got preventing fertilization, which is the physical barriers. You've got prevent implantation, which is the IUD or the coil. And you've got the timing of intercourse because of this variation of fertility throughout the menstrual cycle. And that's also true for increasing fertility. You can choose the time of the month that has the highest or lowest time of uh, chance of fertility, depending on whether you do want the woman to get pregnant or not. Other ones for increasing fertility is to get the woman to produce more eggs by FSH injection. But remember, that's quite closely linked to IVF because IVF almost guarantees the chance of the sperm finding the egg and causing fertilization. So take a screenshot of this because this summarizes everything in this video. But hopefully that's been a really useful video for you just for your future and for your decisions you're going to make in your life. This one goes way beyond just the biology specification. So hopefully this has been really, really useful to you. So as I said at the start, that was the last one for body communication. So where I'd like you to head now is to a very short playlist on the blood. It's only two lessons long, but it's really, really important, especially this one, the first one of the two. This is on blood and overview, and it consolidates multiple areas of your course. I've been able to pull bits from so many different topics to give a very comprehensive overall review of a huge area of biology. Because think, the blood touches every part of your body. So head to this one next. The second one in the playlist is on the kidney and how that cleans and regulates the blood. But that's where I want you to head next. As always, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. It really does help me to have as many subscribers as, as possible. Like this video if you find it useful and do send it on to people because as I've said, it's too important a topic for your life to get this wrong. Also head over to my Facebook channel, have a look on there. There's loads of infographics with more random bits of biology to keep you entertained. Thank you.